It was 2013, and I was living in Austin, Texas, making headway as a freelance journalist. Scrolling through feminist Twitter one day, looking for story ideas, I came on a piece in a trade publication that stopped me cold. The Kinsey Institute, ground zero for sex research, had hired a new director, a woman named Dr. C. Sue Carter. The article said Dr. Carter's work was the missing link between sex, love, relationships, and trauma. She'd run studies on these monogamous rodents called prairie voles that had revealed the biological mechanisms underlying social relationships. The way the brain chemicals oxytocin and vasopressin work in regulatory pathways to determine how we humans grow up and behave. Now, I don't have a science background, but in the time it took me to finish reading the piece, I had somehow decided I would try to write a feature article about Sue Carter for a major publication. Now, I'm so not a scientist that I picked what college I attended partly because math and science classes were optional there. <laughs> Nothing about me is linear or orderly. I spent most of my 20s flailing, and the most time I've spent in the same place of employment is a year and a half. By 2013, I was 28 and had figured things out enough to know I wanted to write for a living. But I was writing about nightclubs and socialist co-ops and Puerto Rican rappers then, not neuroendocrinology. Looking back now, it's obvious why I had such a strong gut instinct to want to tell people about Dr. Carter. Of course, I wanted to get my first big byline. Of course, I thought it would be fun to, cov to cover the Kinsey Institute and write a sassy article related to sex. After all, my Hogwarts house is Carrie Bradshaw. But the biggest reason was this. Dr. Carter's story was my story. Dr. Carter's work uncovering these intertwined regulatory pathways explains how each of us approach our relationships, the territories that for humans are at the heart of survival and of meaningful existence. In Prairie Voles and humans, the interplay of oxytocin and vasopressin compel a mother and father to care for their young and shape the way they care for her or him. Um, but the thing about these pathways in humans is they are shaped by the care that we receive in our environment, particularly in early life. If a child is raised in a nurturing, caring world, her pathways are likely to be healthy. But if a child is traumatized or abused or is even exposed to trauma or abuse, it can alter how those pathways develop. Sexual trauma in particular, Carter found, has particularly shattering effects. When I read about Carter's findings, it felt like I was looking in a mirror that reflected my experience in the world for the first time. My body knew those effects of trauma. When I was four, I saw a male care caregiver, someone close to my family, molest a child. I hid in the top bunk where a ceiling fan spun a few feet from my head. I suppressed the memory of this moment until my 20s, but that didn't matter. It still became the bedrock of what my body knew about trust and sexuality. I was also raised in a household characterized by parental neglect, which is a form of complex trauma. My mom was a, spo a stoic German, the granddaughter of rough peasants, and she ran her kids' lives with grim efficiency. My mismatched clothes often had holes in them, and the lunch I packed myself for school was often a cheese and cracker packet and a Capri Sun. Carter's work explained how these adverse childhood events shaped my outlook as I grew up, which was this, feeling like I didn't deserve to take up space in the world, as though I did not belong in relationships with people who valued me. Shame at feeling desire or being an object of desire. In college, when I started getting asked out on dates, I'd be startled to find myself begging my roommate to go out on my date for me. I would be so anxious that my scalp hurt. As much as I'd wanted to be with someone, before I could get to know them, my past would rush up through my cells, smash the glass case, and pull the alarm. Eventually, I got through the anxiety by drinking, but I consistently ended up with guys who were flawed enough or mismatched enough that they were emotionally safe. If you go out with people who are obviously wrong for you, you get to stay in control because you know that you'll never fully fall for them, never have to be vulnerable, risk exposing your heart. It kept my romantic roster interesting. 
if not healthy. There was Jacob, the professional pickup artist, Alex, the emotionally abusive lawyer, and Lucho, the washed-up Argentine tennis pro who always wore both a gold chain and a beret. <laughs> so while publishing Dr. Carter's story was a career stepping stone for me, the stakes were personal. Her research had explained to me why I was so full of self-doubt and fear, how small moments of neglect and violence of the past were haunting me now through a regulatory system that they'd made go haywire. I had to write about Dr. Carter's impact because I had to tell the people like me who felt fucked up exact, exactly what was going on. So I drafted and polished a pitch and I sent it to the Atlantic. They wrote back and they said they'd take a profile of Carter. I emailed Kinsey and arranged an interview. Within days, Dr. Carter gave me her personal cell. We spoke in fits and spurts around her busy schedule when she was at the airport or between important meetings. We talked about her girlhood spent outside in rural Missouri, how it had made her curious about what animated the things that she observed. I was a little in love. <laughs> but when I submitted my article to The Atlantic, the editor wrote back to say she didn't think it quite worked. She said it was too long and Carter too controversial and that I could try again and write something short but that there were no guarantees. I knew Carter's full story needed to be told, so I looked for a new home for it. And where it ended up was that men's magazine, well known for being read for its articles. <laughs> Playboy's editor responded to my email the same afternoon I pitched him. We love the Kinsey Institute here for obvious reasons, he wrote, and offered me a pile of money and a 4,000 word story. I just needed to sign the contract. As a woman, I felt conflicted, but Playboy had brought conversation about sex into the open. Plus, most of the magazine's readers were old white men. If my aim was to reach people who were fucked up, I had hit the bullseye. <laughs> Their wars and capitalist greed had driven the planet to the brink of ruin, but maybe, just maybe, learning what Carter's work revealed about the reverberating devastation of trauma might heal them or give them pause. I signed on the dotted line. And at this point, a new obstacle emerged, Dr. Carter. She didn't want to heal those old white guys. Dr. Carter was smarter. She knew they were not only fucked up, but dangerous. And her instinct, honed over a lifetime, was to stay the hell away from them. She told me my story published there would reach haters of science who'd turn around and lobby the Indiana State Legislature to defund Kinsey. It seemed sad and strange she was so insistent on avoiding Playboy readers, but the more I learned, the more I understood her concern. For instance, I'd interviewed her peers, who were eminent scientists, and they told me that misplaced credit for Dr. Carter's work had propelled a guy, of course it was a dude, all the way to the head of the National Institutes of Health. But I still couldn't abandon her story, which was about people like me or worse off than me in a million different ways. I couldn't uproot the seed of indignation, unfurling tendrils of anger and grief inside me when I thought of how I might have been different. So I became a thorn in Dr. Carter's side and she in mine. She told me her board disapproved of the Playboy story so she could not sit for an interview, meaning I'd have to write this story based on phone interviews. That made it difficult, but I kept fighting anyway. I bought thick conference proceedings and ordered research papers and anything else that could explain Carter's work to me. But soon the whole project began to drag. The stack of drafts and notes and books on my desk got tall and then got jammed into a suitcase in the trunk of my silver Honda Civic. My lease in Austin was up and to save money, I decided to spend the summer traveling, which meant um, while trying to write this, I'd be living out of my car along with my Pekingese radar. <laughs> I'd wanted to spend a lot of that time back near where I grew up in California, near here, with my mom, who had advanced cancer. But between us, something was deeply fractured. She had softened, and I was trying to be kind, but it was very hard to be there for someone who hadn't been there for me. It didn't feel great that I was starting to understand the biology of why, just as it was too late. When I hit rock bottom that summer was, I think, at the end of a four-day camping trip in the Redwoods on soggy Mount Tamalpais, north of San Francisco. 
Um, I'd spend most of the time there in a tent highlighting passages of a dictionary-sized volume that I'd bought. The more I read, the more I wondered how I was ever going to make sense of the article that I was supposed to write, which back at my mom's I'd cut up and arranged around the dining room. On my last night on Mount Tam, after I finished a bowl of ramen noodles cooked in a downpour of distilled redwood flavored fog, I was invited to join a roaring campfire by the family of earnest East Bay gentrifiers at the campsite down from me. I'd been working nonstop, so I let myself take a break. The wind kicked up and the redwood downpour turned to a deluge, and I lent the family my spare blue tarp to keep the water from flooding their little boys out of their tent. Meanwhile, they fed me s'mores wrapped in bacon. (laughs) Nothing tastes better when you're wet and cold than something hot and simultaneously sweet and salty and fatty. And then they handed me a pork chop. (laughs) No one could locate silverware, so I pressed the thick piece of meat with my fingers and nails like a cavewoman and dug in. The pork chop seemed like a godsend, a hunk of happiness in my otherwise confusing summer. A small puddle was forming on top, and I didn't care. Meat juices ran down my chin, and the mellow notes of charred gristle exploded across my tongue. And for a moment, I didn't think about Dr. Carter. I thought about myself, and it felt good. And then the mother of the family looked at me with her headlamp. You know, I've been wondering, she said. I know why we are here, but why are you here? And I had been wondering the same thing myself lately. Why wasn't I camping camping somewhere dry? Why was I alone today and in life when Dr. Carter says we are social creatures who perform optimally with robust social support? What was my purpose in life? Was it really to write about oxytocin while damp and living out of my car? But this stranger digging at all these vulnerable places took my breath away. She made being a complicated person sound like something bad When right then, I was feeling like being complicated was probably the best thing I had going for me. I already knew that I was way off whatever the set path you're supposed to follow in life is. Now she was taking issue with my entire identity. I pretended not to hear her and mumbled something about needing to go to my tent. I set the cooling pork chop on my ice chest. When I reemerged, it was gone, lifted by a creature of the night. I saw it as a sign. I didn't need her pity, and I could get my own pork chops. (laughs) The story about Dr. Carter ended up getting killed. I think for a lot of reasons. I was probably in over my head. Playboy magazine was in turmoil in a world awash in free, unlimited online porn. And Hugh Hefner's philanthropist daughter had paid a visit to Sue Carter sometime between when I turned in my third draft to my editor and when I found out the story was dead. There's no way that Carter didn't beg Hefner, woman to woman, to get that story pulled. I was devastated, more than devastated, but I had to embrace myself as I was, or start to. Back in Austin that fall, I was scrolling through Twitter again. And one day I came across a story about an assassin an apparent avenger of the femicides in Ciudad Juarez, a heroine straight out of Marvel, if you squinted a little. She called herself Diana, the huntress of bus drivers, and I fell a little in love. Band first timer, Katie Matlock!